to them and they can build a little empire somewhere and, and it'll be a wonderful thing. And it's not like that at all. Church planting is incredibly hard. No matter where you are, there are things against it. And serving people, it's very hard to serve people. And sometimes you are very, very unappreciated. So if you're doing it for yourself and you're doing it because you want to get something out of it yourself for you, then you're in the wrong line of work. <laughs> okay? But if you're doing it for Christ and you really are wanting to serve God from your heart, then you will see satisfaction in serving Christ, not from what appreciation you get back from people. Of course it's nice to be appreciated. Of course it's nice to be respected and, and admired for what work you do. That's a natural thing. Our ego longs for that. But if we expect it in the service of God, then we're, we're really expect, uh, we have unreasonable expectations and we need to change them. Okay? But we do it for God, then we get our rewards from God. We get our rewards in heaven. And it says here in verse 6, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's where our appreciation comes from. That's where our, our whole motivation comes from. Because we have, it says in verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, as we have received mercy. And then in the end it says... Um, that uh, it's God who's shone in our hearts mm. to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So that's that's really where we're about. You know, that's that's what we're doing. What we're doing. That's that's what motivates us. That's what people don't necessarily understand, because um, we can be slapped in the face. We can be mm. trodden down. We can be mm. mocked. We can be um, beaten up in a way. Um, and yet we don't give up, we don't stop, we keep going. Why? Why would we do that to ourselves? Are we masochists? No. We're just servants of the great God, the Most High God. We're just servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all that he suffered um, for us, um, for our benefit, to bring us to God, um, <coughs> makes it all worthwhile because we know he loves us that much. And we know that that is our, that is our work. From now on, is we're serving God, and so it's about the glory of the of the new covenant, chapter three, verse seven. It's about the glory of that new covenant of praising and serving God and our attitude to God, and therefore we no longer have this veil. We can step into and be part with God once more. Yes. Okay, we're going to move on very quickly to the uh, to the gospel, and it's Mark's gospel. Mark's Gospel, and it's chapter 9, verse 2 to 9. And this is something uh, where the Lord Jesus Christ is uh, takes his disciples up on a mountain, three of them. This was the, this was the inner group so you know Christ had his disciples um, but but obviously Peter James and John were were, were perhaps allowed to, to have a, a closer walk with Jesus and these were the three that went up on the mountain with him and we see that Jesus here is transfigured and uh, we're back to that shining again, like Moses, and um, that he was bright white. Um, and uh, it says that his in verse through uh, chapter nine, verse three, it says his clothes became shining exceedingly, white like snow, such as no launder on earth can whiten them. I mean, we see these adverts on TV where we have these clothes washed by whatever detergent they are, and they're like, you know, glowing, fluorescent white, you know. 
nothing compared to what Christ was like on that day, that this was something else. If you put anything against white driven snow, mm. it pales into insignificance. And you can imagine that this was, this was like that. It's white like snow, such as no laundered, no, no piece of cloth could be laundered yeah. and make it as white as, uh, as, as Christ's clothes were as he was transfigured. And then we have Elijah and Moses appearing suddenly. Wow, what was that like? Imagine what that was like. You know, you've got the, the disciples there, Peter, James and John, and suddenly, not only does Jesus suddenly change and all his clothes, you know, like, whoa, what's happening here? But then suddenly, two great prophets arrive. And they suddenly stand beside him, Moses and Elijah. And they hadn't met Moses and they hadn't met Elijah, but they knew who it was. Yes. That's interesting too. Yeah. They knew who it was. And they were talking with Jesus. And they were listening. And Peter and James and John were talking, they were all talking together. But they were obviously very afraid because they didn't understand, obviously didn't understand what was going on. Now Moses, he died on Mount Nemo mm -hmm. when he was 120 years of age, so he must have been pretty old when he came back there. Um, if he came back, I'm sure he was, you know, he would have been Moses at 120, he would have been quite old, wouldn't he, if he died at 120, but who knows, he might have been given a new body. But they, rec they understood who he was, and Elijah was taken up with the, the chariot of fire. Um, so, There's, there's something really quite unusual going on here. And, uh, and then suddenly there's a cloud comes and a voice comes out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. So the same as what happened to him when, he was, when Jesus was baptised in the Jordan. This is my beloved son. Yeah. In the Jordan he said, of whom I am well pleased. Mm. And here he says, hear him. Mm. In other words, listen to him. Yes. Hear his words because he is the Son of God. Yeah. And then suddenly they look around and the, only Jesus is there. The prophets have gone. Yeah. And so then Jesus says to them, don't tell anyone about this until, I, until the Son of Man rises from the dead. Well, the Son of Man isn't the Son of God and yet the Son of Man is the Son of God. Yeah. So this is where we have a voice from heaven saying that Jesus is the Son of God. In effect, this is my beloved Son. The voice came from heaven. Where, who else would that be? They didn't have planes in that day and age. They had a pilot walking past going, that is my Son! No, it wasn't like that. This is a voice from heaven. It must be God's voice. And saying, this is my beloved Son. So, we in this passage we have straight away an understanding, not only is he transfigured and it becomes like an angel to look at, this voice comes out of a cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Mm -hmm. So there's no question with the apostles at that time, the disciples at, as they were at that time, that Jesus was the son of God. Suddenly they're being faced with this fact that, you know, he gets transfigured, that's a bit weird, that's a bit weird, and then suddenly there's this voice saying that he's his son. And then Jesus himself calls himself the Son of Man. Yes. And they didn't understand that. They didn't really understand that. So they were questioning what the rising from the dead meant. They didn't really understand what was going to happen. So in the two, in this section we have the two the two sides of Jesus. One is he's the son of God, the other is he is the son of man. So he is fully God and he's fully man. That's the important thing for us, which is when we put the wine into the chalice and we say this is the blood of Christ, this is the, the divinity of Christ represented by this wine, and then we put a little bit of water in to signify that he was also fully man, that he was both God and man. He was the God man. That's what he was. Okay? Okay. 